Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Perfect. Okay. Yeah, you're all good. Okay. So then I think we can get started. So welcome to the first Hazura community call. We are very happy that you were all able to make it. And I want to introduce myself quickly. So I'm Marion. I'm developer experience engineer at Hasura, and I will be your host for this call. Before we get started with the actual content, um, I want to talk a little bit about the purpose of this community call. So it will be for both the user community and the open source contributing community. Um, by the way, can you see my screen? Okay. So for the user side, we will give product updates on the different parts at Hasura that we're working on, um, both what we're working on at the moment and what will be part of future releases. You will be able to ask questions. Please ask your questions on the chat um, during the presentations if you have any. And in the end, I will pick them out and ask the presenter these questions. <coughs> then for the open source contributing community, we will have guidelines and demos on how to contribute. So for today, I will give an overview on how you can contribute to Hasura and what areas of contributions there are. And starting in the next call, I will show demos on how to set up um, the development environment so that you can get started with contributing. Also starting in the next call, we will share specific issues that we find suitable for open source contributions. Now, as for the agenda of today, first we will give an update from the side of Azura. Richie will talk about the console work we're doing. Shahid will talk about the CLI. Alexis will go into what server work we're currently working on. And finally, Tiru will talk about actions, the feature that I think everybody is waiting for. Then we will have a community demo by Jason. He will talk about how to deploy Hazura on digital ocean managed Kubernetes. And as I said, in the end, I will give an overview on how you can contribute to Hazura. And with this, I will give over to Rishi to start about talking about the console. Uh, hi, can you hear me? Am I yes. audible? Okay, uh, I'm gonna share my screen. Hi, so uh, I'm Rishi. I work on the graphical engine console. And today I will be uh, showing a few features that we have added over, a past couple, over the past couple of weeks. Uh, I'll, I'll do quick uh, two or three demos and then I'll talk about what, what features are coming next. Right, so let's get into it. Firstly, it's uh, custom GraphQL fields. As you all know, Hasura gives you real-time GraphQL over Postgres, apart from a lot of other things. So uh, first, let's start with creating the table. This is a fresh Hasura instance that I have. Just a second. Did, did Rishi drop off on the call? Uh, I think we, we have lost Rishi. Um, Shahid, do you want to continue with the CLI yes. until he's yes. back? Yes, I'll, yeah, I'll start with the CLI. I want to back. 
Awesome. So, okay. So I'm going to talk about a few uh, features that we recently pushed out on the CLI. Um, so to demo the first one, I'm going to share my screen. Okay, I can share my desktop too. Okay. Is my terminal visible? Yes. Okay. Awesome. So one of the reason thing that we did was uh, introduce a new command called Hasidar Migrate Squash, which will let you squash certain migrations into a single one. So it's still in preview. It's still ironing out certain side parts of the command where there are issues with some down migrations being generated. So I'm just going to show a simple demo. So I have a GraphQL engine instance running locally. I'm just going to open it, open my uh, console on it. For that, I need to first create a Hasidar project directory. So I'm going to do Hasidar init. I'm going to give it a name, squash demo. I'm going to give it a name called squash demo. So I have this project directory set up. Um, so now I have my migrations directory, nothing is there, it's empty. My config.yaml points to my local GraphQL engine instance. So I'm going to start the console here now. So the console is now running on localhost 80, localhost 9695. Just going to zoom it up a little bit. So as we know, now if I do any action on the console, uh, corresponding uh, migrations will be created, right? So I'm just going to create a table, uh, create table authors. Uh, I'll just create a ID column and a name column. And that's one migration. I'll now create another table called articles. And similarly, an ID column, uh, title of the article and maybe body of the article. And I want to denote the author also, author ID, which will be a UUID again. I'm not going to select the foreign key right now because I'll do it in the next step. So now I'm going to add a foreign key from this table author ID to the author's table ID column. And I'm going to save that. So it's now three migrations. I'm also going to add the relationships on the articles table and on the others table as well. So relationships are also added. So now let's go back and look at our migrations directory. I'm gonna cancel this. So we have one, two, three, four, five migrations. So I can also look at Asura migrate status. It tells me I have five migrations, right? Now it this kind of, uh, let's say it, this particular five migrations are kind of a single unit. For example, I just created two tables and linked them to using foreign keys and relationships. Uh, in certain scenarios, I might want to experiment a lot, create tables, delete tables, add columns, modify relationships, add permissions. And then finally, I might want to say that save all of them as a single migration. So the squash commands help this command helps you do that. So if you look at the usage, it all it needs is Oops, sorry. All it needs is uh, uh, a version to start from. So it will squash from that particular version to the latest version. So I will look at the migrate list again and I'll pick the first one. So I want to squash from this one to the end of the migration to the last one. So I'll say Hasra migrate squash iPhone iPhone from and I'll give the version number. Before I do that, let's look at an individual migration in detail. So for example, let's say uh, the create table. So if you look at the create table, we have an up, up some SQL in the up action, and then we are, we are also tracking the table. So we will have also have a down step for it where the table is dropped. Now, if I do squash on these migrations, all these actions will be converted into a single one. And it's gonna it's telling me that these migrations are gonna be squashed into a single one. And if I want to delete the source files, if I want to delete the actual source files. So I'm gonna go ahead with yes. 
So it's creating the it just created the migrations now. Now if I look at my migration directory, we, I have only one migration. So if I look at this single migration, I will find four files. And if I look at them one by one, I have all the SQL concatenated into one single file. It creates two tables and add the foreign key. And if I look at the next uh, app.yaml file, I have all the metadata in a duplicated, no, I mean deduplicated fashion where, where each action is only twice. What this also does is if let's say in your migrations, you have created a table and then later drop the table or create a relationships and later remove that relationship that will not even come up in this list. It will be removed uh, internally. So here we can see the track table action for the two tables, uh, uh, authors and articles table as a track. We are creating an object relationship and then we are creating another relationship just as we did in the, we did on the console. So now we can apply this migration elsewhere as a single unit. So we are looking for feedback. We have put a couple of feedback and we're working on it. And if you can try this out on your set of migrations and give us feedback, that'll be really helpful. So you can use the Discord channel to communicate, preview channel to communicate the feedback to us. Another small feature I wanted to uh, demo was the metadata diff command, which is a very basic diff right now. Um, let's say I have uh, exported my metadata using the metadata export command. Now I'll have a metadata file which describes the state of my GraphQL engine. So let's say I have done something like, uh, uh, let's say I've done something like renamed or added one more table. Let's say I've added one more table. So that would be like adding one more entry here, which says, Table, uh, I can say schema public and name new table. So now is a change in the file. So if I use Hasura metadata apply hyphen hyphen dry run, it will tell me what has changed, right? So this new file has this new uh, entry has been created. So you can also use this with Hasura metadata diff command. So this is, it again, I highlights the change. So if the change was on the server, it is highlighted in a different fashion. And this command can be used along, uh, this command can be used with two metadata files as well. Uh, they can diff two uh, different metadatas. So this is actually a community contribution. Uh, yeah, a huge shout out to the author. I have to look up the name. Um, yeah, that. So the, yeah, that's pretty much it. So we would this we would like feedback on these two commands, and both the commands are not reviewed, so things can change around. And yeah, that's pretty much it from my side. Back to Mario. Thank you, Shahid, for this update on the CLI. Um, Alexis, do you want to go next to give updates on what we're working on on the server? Sure, can everybody hear me okay? Yes. All right, so let me share my screen. All right, so this should be pretty quick um, because a lot of what we've been working on on the server for just kind of the past few weeks is we're really trying to uh, stop having all of our releases have the word beta on the end. And so to figure out how we can get a real 1.0 release, um, we've been focusing a lot on some bug fixes and really focusing on making sure that the performance is working well. So we've been implementing a few uh, different changes that we're hoping will both make it easier for us to get insight into the performance of um, Hasura instances and, and to figure out why maybe particular problems people have been having are happening, but then also just trying to, to make sure that the releases that we put out are, are more reliable. And we do have a really extensive test suite, which is very nice, but maybe not the most extensive test suite when it comes to uh, performance. So we're trying to improve that. One thing that I do want to show though, which is uh, just kind of 
something that's almost kind of happened as a side effect of that. That's a little bit more exciting than just bug fixes. Is a change that uh, is not quite merged yet, but should be shortly to the way subscriptions work. So here I have a really simple uh, schema running in a server right here that's just as a user's database and a post database that has some blog posts for these users. And so today in Hasura, if you um, run a query that has multiple fields, it works totally fine. But if you run a subscription and it has multiple top level fields, then you get an error. And this is something that is uh, actually mandated by the GraphQL specification. Um, for whatever reason, they completely disallow subscriptions to have more than one top level field. And I would imagine this is probably because if you have, if you're combining information from multiple data sources, they don't want to put a burden on the implementation to somehow figure out how to multiplex that information together. But in this case, because uh, these two queries are both coming from Postgres, it's a little bit silly to disallow this. So on uh, kind of this development version that I have here, I can create a subscription on both users and this, the console currently still uh, shows an error, but um, we can probably change that. But you can see that we get data back here. And so if I were to insert something into the user's database here and add another user and go back over here, then it shows up totally fine. So that's something that's uh, kind of almost a minor quality of life improvement. And um, hopefully we'll find that useful. Uh, another thing that I wanted to briefly mention is, um, actually, I can't quite find it. Ah, this one. So um, on the topic of performance specifically, we currently in Hazura, the, the plan cache is completely unbounded. So if you run Hazura, and you just kind of leave it sitting there for a long time, then it will continue to cache plans indefinitely. And if you're only using a handful of different queries, that's totally fine. Um, but if you have a lot of different queries that maybe are generated by the uh, client, then this can cause a variety of problems because it can end up leaking memory. And so in the next version, we're going to add a optional argument to change this uh, so that you can actually have a bounded cache, which honestly we probably should have had for a long time and should have had from the beginning. But uh, just to avoid maybe causing any problems in case there's any performance regressions, we're going to start by releasing it under a flag. And uh, it would be really useful if people can try this out um, once we release it and, and let us know if it works and if it doesn't then we'll figure out how to fix it. And that's really all I have to say uh, on that. I think Tira will have something a little bit more exciting to talk about on the server side, but that's all I have to say for now. Thank you, Alexis, on this update. So in the meantime, we have some questions on the CLI. Shahid, do you want to address them? Yes, so we have a question from Majid who is asking if you have already migrated some versions, can we squash them? Yes, you can totally do that. Um, yeah, you can clean up your old migrations. Um, one thing you might want to do is to use one more command called uh, migrate apply, and then mark that squashed migration as applied. So this, uh, you can, you can just use the command and say this is a squashed version and it is already applied. It's actually, it's mentioned, mentioned in the release notes. So maybe I can just do a quick demo. Let's see. Right, so if I look at my status, my git status, it says this mini, but this one is not present. So I can just copy that ID 
and do consider migrate apply and skip execution and this particular version so this will mark that particular migration is applied and then you can continue using as it as it just works so the next question that we have is from jason let me pull that up or gordon okay gordon is asking is the squash feature safe to use with file set at hand road yes it is safe to use with file set at hand road uh, it kind of reads your uh, migration for what it is it is not dependent on uh, what the console generates. It can read migrations as long as it is a valid Asura metadata API call. So yeah, Jason has already answered Martin's question. Thanks, Jason. And yeah, that's it from me. Thank you, Shahid. So I think Rishi is back. Do you want to go next? Uh, yes, sure. Okay. Okay, so uh, I don't know where I, uh, where you all lost me, so I, I'm just going to start from uh, scratch. Uh, so my name is Rishi, and I work on the Graphical Engine console, and I'll be uh, showing you a couple of features that we added over the past couple of weeks. Uh, some of you might know these features, but I'm just putting it out there just in case. Uh, yeah, and they're cool features. So uh, firstly, uh, custom GraphQL fields. Uh, so as you know, uh, Hasura gives you real-time GraphQL on Postgres, uh, apart from a lot of other things. Uh, so let me create a table first. This is a fresh Hasura instance that I have. I'm creating a simple user table. Rishi, are you sharing? Rishi, we can't see your screen. Oh, now it's okay. Okay, yeah. So uh, the I'm I'm creating a new table called user, and I'm gonna give it a name and an email, right? And I'll just create this table. So as you see, Hasura has generated some uh, GraphQL root field associated with this table. Uh, in, in the query root, there is user, user aggregator, and user by PK. And these are the ones in mutation, uh, in mutation root. So uh, let's look at insert user, for instance. Let's say I'm just going to make a sample mutation here. I'm audible, right? Yes, you are. Yes. All right, and uh, yeah, this works. Now, just what in uh, what if I don't want insert user in my client client side code? Uh, I I maybe for whatever reason, maybe I don't want camel case, or maybe I don't want snake case. I want it in camel case, or maybe I don't want to expose the name of my table, or whatever reason it is. So Hasura allows you to customize the root field associated with the table. So you just go to the table, modify page, and go to the custom GraphQL root field section and basically update the associated root field. You can uh, uh, change everything, but I'm just uh, setting insert user for now. So now if I go back and this should work. You can, uh, you can also do this for columns. You can change the graphical fields associated with the column. So I have email here. I'm gonna just call this email address. If I go back, and this should work, right? So that is about uh, customizing GraphQL root fields. Uh, you can customize your GraphQL root fields with Hasura. Next thing is uh, we had some uh, graphical improvements. Uh, we integrated, as you must have seen, we integrated uh, the newer version of GraphQL Explorer, which looks pretty. And uh, more importantly, it also has uh, it uh, also allows you to have multiple operations. In graphical, so uh, which is which was not possible with the earlier version of Graphical Explorer. So uh, and finally, if you want to run it, you just run by choosing the operation name. So that is about graphical. Uh, next, check constraints. So check constraints is a Postgres feature that allows you to set a boolean condition for a table, and uh, and that boolean condition should should be satisfied for every row in that table. So now uh, we allow you to set check constraints. To the console, as you see in this example, uh, this email address. Even if I send this, it, it, it will work because it is a simple text field. Ideally, I want some validation for validating this, validating that this is an email address, right? So uh, let's do that. 
I go to the tables modify page. I add a check constraint. I call this email regex and say email matches. Let's quickly copy this regex. Okay, it's email address. I'm sorry. Email address was an alias. Sorry. Right. Now, if I go back and I try to insert this, it should throw me an error because it does not match that regex. And uh, this will work. Right. So that's about check constraints. You can use it for data validation at the table level. Uh, for more complex data validation, we have more exciting stuff coming soon that Diru will present to you. And about some more things that are coming soon, there is computed fields. Computed fields allows you to inject a inject a field in in a in a table, which 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 returns the response from a from an SQL function. So it is uh, the server already supports it. You can go to the docs and look for computed fields. Uh, it is already done on the server side. Just that the UI has to be implemented for the, for that, uh, which will happen in the upcoming few weeks. Uh, next thing is actions. It is already in preview. Uh, Tiru will talk more about it. And similarly for remote joins, which is another big cool feature that is in preview and it will come soon. Well, that's it. That's it from my side. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rishi. Um, there's some questions for you. Actually, one question. Do you want to address this right now? The root field customization is cool. We were using GQLS. Yeah, it is cool. Yeah, that's it. I mean, it's not a question. OK. OK, perfect. So then, um, cool. thanks, know. Shankar. It's cool. Yeah. No, th you, uh, Rishi, you missed the question about it. So the question was from Gavin, who says, is there any focus on focus or interest in improving the web console experience in regards to creating new tables or working with records? Is there or, any focus on improving the yeah. web I think what is what Gavin is uh, pointing at is uh, inserting nested records from the console, for example, like for articles you can insert. Uh, oh, right. Uh, I think nothing nothing yet. We don't have any plans yet, but yeah, that's a cool thing. We'll think about it. Yeah, I think you also created an issue regarding this. I remember seeing an issue corresponding to this. So we, we will definitely look at it and come up with a response on the issue. Thanks, Kevin, for the idea and the question. OK, thank you, Rishi and Shahid. So Tiru, um, are you ready to talk about actions? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Can you all see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay, awesome. Uh, hey, everyone. So we have been hearing this a lot. Like uh, people ask us quite recently, actually, like everyone's like, how do we do business logic in uh, Hasura? It just gives me crud. Uh, so what's the story there? Uh, so first of all, like what we have seen so far, we have been in production with so many users uh, because they have uh, kind of used or kind of understood how to use the combination of auth as well as crud to do like client side logic and properly build an app uh, so that business logic is kind of uh, some it's kind of avoided because most of the logic is uh, embedded in the auth system itself and combined with what rishi just showed you with uh, check constraint support in the console i think it's it's going to get even easier for you to do pure crud like uh, business logic uh, from the client itself, uh, but there are still use cases where, uh, like a backend developer might go, Hey, I have to do all these things. I have to call some rest API. I have to do this and that, uh, this is not the way that I build my logic. Uh, this is a question everyone's, uh, asking us and we have been working on it. Uh, so this, this talk is about that. So before, uh, uh before that, the two main concerns, I mean, uh, the two very important things that we want to do, uh, embody in the feature that we built for this is that uh, the GraphQL layer should be separated from the business logic. 
that is somebody who's writing the business logic should not worry too much about the graphql implementation or any of the granular details uh, which are not related to their application logic itself right so that is very critical uh, the second thing is that the permission system that hasura already has it's a very complex permission system you can model a lot of things that also should be somehow automatically uh, implemented while you are writing your logic so you don't have to worry about those things as well so these were very two uh, uh, important criteria that uh, we really wanted to like uh, make sure is brought out uh, while we implement this feature uh, so yeah so i think most of you might already know it's called actions uh, and i'm going to show you how you can uh, build your action in just three steps uh, so that means you can do whatever you want in uh, with these three step formula <laughs> so the step one is uh, defining your own custom types so now you have in the console another tab called actions and you might uh, I, i hope it's visible uh, so that you can read a little bit is that you kind of extend the type mutation so in your mutation root now you can add a new field which is up to you you can define whatever you want and you can give it input uh, fields like arg1 over here uh which takes which is of type sample input and it the and the type of this field is sample output both of which you kind of define yourself uh in the in the window below so you can define whatever you want over there and you can kind of build your own uh you can just extend the mutation type that hasura has yourself uh so this is the kind of the graphql concern that i talked about like you here you just defining the kind of schema or kind of kind of the view that you want in your application uh so that this is it this is all uh, the graphql stuff that you have to do uh for using actions right uh now the second thing is uh, how do you actually resolve them and how do you uh, fill in the business logic uh which you want to be implemented uh, when this uh, action is called from the client uh which could be in the front end or the back end wherever uh so for this one way is that you can go in the functions route where uh each action belongs is implemented via a function which could be a http endpoint which is hosted in a serverless uh, way maybe in a serverless platform it could be any route in your existing microservice uh this uh, so you can have a lot of actions in the same microservice at different routes and what not so this is uh, this, this fits in with any existing architecture that you have as long as there is a http endpoint and what you do in that http endpoint is a small code snippet over here uh where you define kind of a function which takes a payload and this payload has the input uh arguments that were sent uh in the action from the client and it also has the session variables the accessor variables and so on uh that you, that will be used for implementing permissions uh right so this is it this is all the code that you write and you get a fully fledged graphql api that you can now start uh uh calling from the client the important thing to note here is that you are just basically returning uh, a response uh, the response that you're doing all you can do whatever you want in this business logic you can call hasura you can call rest apis you can do whatever you want in the end you just have to return the response type that you defined previously so in this case it's just a simple order id and i think most uh, most function calls or any business logic would end up just generating new ids or uh some uh, like it it would generate some kind of a json which makes sense for you to like uh build over so i'll show you, i'll show you show you what i mean in the, in the next slide uh so yeah so this is the first way the second way is if you have uh if you have slightly simpler logic you don't want to write an http function or so on and so forth you can use postgres itself uh with its complex uh uh functions ecosystem uh where you can write uh in say pure sql functions or you can write in this new thing called plv8 which is a secure node js runtime so you can write node js code there and uh, it would be run by postgres in a secure environment so you don't have to worry about uh security and so on uh so th these are the two kinds of uh, resolvers we have uh, we'll be launching in the first version maybe there will be more later on uh but this is uh, this is basically the first version uh of resolvers Uh, the, se the second thing is uh, the third thing is third. Uh, this is step three, and this is what I was talking about when I was talking about uh, returning just a minimum JSON. Is that even though you just return a minimum JSON like order ID, you can also create relationships with this order ID with your existing tables uh, that you have, 
And as shown in this example, I'm making the exact request placeholder, which and the webhook logic is similar. It's just this, and all it, and it returns order ID, although the return type of the mutation can access the entire graph. That is because uh, uh, while you're creating this action, you can also kind of link order ID with uh, a tables ID, uh, something like a foreign key relationship with the response type of the action, right? And you'll be able to do something like this. Uh, so this was basically the three-step formula to like build your own action, uh, do your own custom logic, but let's make it even more powerful uh, by making it event-driven. Uh, what do I mean by that is uh, basically when you're creating this action, if you look at the left screenshot here, you have an option to choose uh, the kind of action this is. So you can just choose asynchronous here and it will automatically make all of this event-driven. What I mean by that again is that whenever you create a, um, an action, it's going to create an event and that event is going to be processed by Hasura, which is actually going to like deliver that to your uh, action handler, which could be an HTTP API or your Postgres function and so on. And you as a client will get subscription fields now. And you, and if you look at the right side, you, uh, uh, you have the subscription, which is called place order now, which takes an input, which is called ID. So this is the action ID that you get back instantly when you create an action. Uh, so instead of uh, getting the result like this before in your mutation type, you would basically just get uh, an action ID instantly and you can now subscribe to this. And if you look at the output, uh, uh, this output field here, which is inside place order, this is order ID. And again, you can like nest uh, all the relationships that you might have with this action and all of this you would get as soon as they are processed and so on. Uh, so this is, this is one powerful add-on uh, which makes actions even even better, right? And why? Uh, so why? What makes action and what makes uh, all this event-driven uh, architecture so cool is that now you get scalability and observability like out of the box without you having to think about it while you're implementing something. Uh, because when you're doing event-driven mutations, your entire system can scale reliably. Like you can have multiple. Like you can kind of control how, what the throughput is and so on by adding either more resources or uh, by having whatever policies that you might have for delivering and so on. And so for large and unpredictable loads, if you did not have something like this, anything could happen, right? Your Postgres uh, server might be overloaded with connections, it might go down and so on. So this is kind of a, going the event-driven route basically gives you all the controls and knobs so that you can scale as you want uh, or automatically and so on uh, without you having to even worry about it. And the second thing is observability, uh, which is basically that you can now, when you do an action and that kind of invokes more actions, it kind of invokes other, other things in your system, maybe even triggers and so on. You would now be also be able to trace the whole workflow of what actually happened from the client to the final uh, mutation, because uh, by virtue of creating an event, you get, event IDs and so on, which you can then keep annotating with every uh, every call that you make to some other system or some other uh, uh, integration that you might have, right? Uh, yeah, so that, that was about uh, the feature. Now you can start uh, adopting it right away. Uh, if you have an existing app or if you're building something brand new, I would uh, like you to like check out threefactor.app, which is kind of an application pattern uh, which relies on being event driven and then subscribing to new updates and so on. Uh, so that has more information about that. But on the right side, it kind of gives you the architecture there uh, where Hasura is make, making uh, queries and uh, subscriptions. Your app is basically making uh, queries and subscriptions and you are making uh, actions on, on that. And Hasura is making it event driven, it's making it scale and whatnot. And you have your business logic all over wherever you want. And finally, it comes back to Hasura, which is then delivered reliably to your app, right? So that's why you can uh, go, uh, you can start using actions today, or if you're building a new app, check out uh, more native patterns uh, on three factor app. And yeah, so how do you get started? Here is the link, uh, a small starter repo, which is just has five steps and you can get uh, going with a, with a locally running preview app of uh, actions. And if you have any use case, you can like uh, definitely uh, ask in Discord. You can also tag me, uh, my ID is over there. And we can like go into more details about how, how to 
uh, model your application so that it uses actions and is using the best features that Hasura has and so on for building your business logic. Yep, thank you. And I'll now check my chat and see the questions. So dear, one question was answered and the next one would be, um, can we use actions or remote schema to write our auth resolvers so that there is only one schema source of truth for clients? I am not 100% sure what you mean by auth resolvers. Could you, oh, I think Tanmay replied. No, that reply was to the question before. Okay. Uh, <laughs> So auth resolvers, by, by that, do you mean, do you, do you want to kind of extend the auth uh, logic that Hasura has? Is that, is that the question? Ah, okay. Yeah. So yeah, absolutely. Like uh, if, if you, yeah, you can totally uh, like have your own auth system. If you want, uh, we, we will, uh, uh, using actions, you can just make it anonymous, like open it up to the anonymous uh, user and then you can uh, perhaps like resolve whatever you want to do and uh, go forward with the rest of the mutations. I mean, I'm, I, I'm not 100% clear about the question, but I think Tanma has answered it half over there, but yeah, I can uh, get into more details uh, in Discord. I, so is there any other question? Maybe one more for time purposes. So, um, has, is Hasura going to queue those actions in the server, similar to event triggers? Oh, there is the question. Oh, uh, is this by manual? Uh, is there any integration with existing serverless infrastructure? Is that the question? Jonathan, just about that. Oh, Jonathan. Uh, will it be possible to extend an existing mutation instead of creating a new one in actions? Uh, so this kind of uh, for uh, this kind of falls into both categories. Like it could be a remote uh, join as well, where you could extend an existing type uh, by adding a remote schema, which has the feel that you might require. Uh, but right now, extending an existing mutation is uh, uh, is not part of the first version. It will be, it, it's, you can clone the types and so on and have an action which looks similar and you can like kind of disable the existing mutation if you want, but uh, the native extending of types for existing uh, mutations that has to auto generates uh, is not there. And it's something that we can definitely consider. And I think it's a valid question for people to like uh, either extend the type or even like overload, overwrite the type and so on. So it's something that we will definitely consider, but for first version, we don't have that. Uh, you, you can copy the type and create a uh, clone of it in some sense. Actually, sorry, just to interrupt, um, uh, just to add to kind of maybe to answer the Jonathan's question a slightly different way. Um, it's um, for extending insert, update, delete mutations. We've actually, there is, um, we're, that's actually quite possible and that will happen in the first release. So in the sense of you should be able to do a Hasura action, create and derive from table and then choose what table you want to have a quote unquote extend the mutation for. And so we'll have kind of like some boilerplate and code gener generation to, to make that easy so that you can kind of, it'll feel like you're delegating to a Hasra mutation, but you can kind of add validation logic in the middle. Um, and, and the experience will kind of feel like that, but, uh, but technically it works a little bit differently under the hood. Um, and like, um, and as, as we, um, you know, feel free to bring ping, ping us on um, discord, ping their own discord and we'll, uh, set you up with an example. Um, just slightly different way of answering um, this. Right. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, so there's a lot of tooling, which is uh, being worked on parallelly. So uh, these are the kind of things that I, I'm not hundred percent aware of, but a lot of people are working on it. So, yeah. So just ping us on discord and uh, we'll answer in more details. Perfect. Thank you very much Tiru. And as you said, if you have more questions, just jump on discord and ask us there. So now I think it's time for the community demo. Jason, are you ready? I am, thank you. Perfect. I'll go ahead and share my screen. Give me just a second, the new security 
permissions are not going to let me share my screen. It's awesome. I have to quit Zoom. So can you give me just two seconds? I'll be right back. Mm -hmm. Sorry, let's try that again. You see my screen okay? Yes, we can. All right, great. So this, this resituated. Uh, so one of the things I did, uh, this thing was a, two weeks ago, was work on kind of getting some documentation for deploying um, Hazura into Kubernetes that's managed by DigitalOcean. Uh, I think it's really smart because it's pretty cost effective too. Uh, and Hazura makes it already so easy to set up a GraphQL API. So I figured might as well make it easier to manage infrastructure as well. So I have this documentation and uh, pull requests pulled up on the right. And I also have some kind of quick little scripts on my local repo that let me kind of, you know, automate the cluster. So um, the only real requirements are, of course, running Kubernetes or kubectl and having DCOTL, which is really hard to say for some reason, uh, which is kind of a digital ocean um, command that lets you do everything that you would possibly need to do in their infrastructure. Um, and the only th other step I've taken, close that out, is also uh, went here and I created a database. So I just have the one Hazura demo that's just Postgres 11. And I've already got the connection string here. So uh, it's pretty easy to actually set up. Uh, if you follow this guide, I have these kind of hard coded as the actual commands that you're going to run. And this will probably take the longest. The cluster is, is uh, going to spin up a three node by default. Uh, and they're all the lowest, um, lowest RAM and CPU usage that they give you. Um, so <clears throat> there is going to be a, a bootstrap piece of this as well that I'm going to kind of walk through and where it will add the metrics uh, that come with DigitalOcean's Kubernetes, um, which are actually the, the kube state metrics that come that ship for Kubernetes. Um, and then we'll also talk about managing secrets because a lot of people will tend to put secrets in Kubernetes um, installations or look at this manifest here. Uh, we'll just kind of hard code those. And that's a really bad practice because you want to really treat your code as, uh, as your, your infrastructure as code. So what Kubernetes has a built-in secrets manager, which is really just saying you're defining environment variables or you can do volumes, but I think environment variables make sense, especially for Hazura. Uh, you give it a name and then you pull that value from a secret key. And once this is kind of set up, probably should have done that ahead of time. It might take the longest. Um, then what it's going to do is going to talk to itself and it's going to pull that data out of the secrets that are stored inside of Kubernetes. The, this is the example file I have right here and I have my, my DB and my admin. Um, those are the only things I really feel I need to be stored as uh, secrets. So what I'll do is, um, you know, there's, there's instructions on, you know, following all, all the way through but there's a, this is kind of the manual way to encode. Those are base 64 encoded, which means they're not secured by default. Um, so that's why I don't have the secrets file as part of a, uh, the Git repo. Those should always be, you know, just left alone. Um, but what I have is a little Kubernetes, let me get the stuff out of the way here. I have a Kubernetes um, Go script or secrets YAML that just lets you run the YAML file and just base 64 of those. So what I can do is just say secrets YAML, and then I called it Hazura secrets. And that'll now take this file and give me the encoded version, uh, which I can't apply because it's still running. And 
um, this will just kind of bootstrap everything for you. So, and, and also create a load balancer, uh, which is right here. The last piece that I feel I need to finish before I can actually mark this as not a work in progress PR is making this actually secure with the, um, you know, let's encrypt, I think is what the load balancers use on DigitalOcean, but this will pull the Hazura and get you ready to go uh, pretty quickly. And that's really all I have. Thank you so much, Jason. First of all, thank you for your contribution and thank you for also showing it on the community call. We really appreciate it. Thank you. So I will share my screen again. Can you all see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay. So, um, as I said before, I will go, um, I will give an overview on how you can contribute to Hazura and then go into more details about, about each of these areas in the next few uh, community calls. So, this is the contributing guide from our GraphQL engine repo. And first of all, the most important thing to say is first time contributors are welcome. So we are trying to make it as easy as possible for everyone to contribute. And if you're a first time contributor and you have a hard time or you don't understand something, just reach out to us on Discord or create an issue and we will be happy to help you. Then areas of contributing. At the moment, we have most contributions in docs community yes, content I, think, I are you sure you're sharing the right uh, page this is the um hasura.ai slash community page on chrome uh, um let me try again I think that should be the contributing guide, right? Yeah, now we can see. Okay. Okay, I'm sorry. So as I said, most contributions we have for documentation, community content, and Hasura CLI. We also have most issues for um, these three areas. So if you would like to work on one of these, you will find already quite a few issues that are suitable for first-time contributors or in general, also experienced contributors. And we are now working on also make it easier to contribute to the console and to the server. And if you would already work on something like this, again, just um, reach out to us. Then inside the, the GraphQL engine report, there's two different ways you can help. So first of all, um, creating an issue. If, you, um, if something is not working right, or if you wish for a new feature, then um, you can create an issue and we will get back to you as soon as possible. And the other thing is to actually work on an issue, which could be, for example, a bug fix or even implementing a feature. So for all these um, areas like server and CLI, for all these components, I will make demos in the next few community calls to show you how to set up the development environment. And now I think... Um, you still see the contributing guide probably, so I have to. No, it's, it's fine right now. Okay. okay. Yeah, we could see the other tab. Okay, perfect. So this is the, um, the community wiki. And here are some other ways that you can contribute. So as I said, one is submitting a PR or creating an issue, but we are also always looking for translation, for example, the readme, or the contributing guide that I showed before. Um, you could write a blog post. We have a technical writer program where we actually pay people to write blog posts. So if you're interested in technical writing, just reach out to us and we will let you know for which content that we are looking for. Other options would be to speak and at an event. If you want to do so, you can reach out to us and we will support you in um, helping you with the slides and also we're happy to send you some swag 
that you can distribute to your audience at the meetup. And regardless of um, if you're already a contributor or if you're um, uh, using Hasura, you should definitely join our Discord channel because there, if you're a beginner, you can ask questions and both the community and the team will be happy to help you. And if you find something else to contribute, please reach out to me on Discord, I'm Marion, or um, marion at hasura.io, you can send me an email and I will make sure to make this part of the next uh, community call to inform how you can contribute in other ways as well. And can you see the presentation now? Okay. <laughs> so yes. it's time to say thank you. First of all, thank you for all the people who did great presentations and demos. And also thank you again to Jason for sharing your contribution. And before we go, um, I want to ask you for feedback. So we want to make our community calls better. So we would be happy if you would give us feedback on this call and also let us know what you would like to see in the next call so that we can incorporate this in our plans for the next call. Also, if you made a contribution and you would like to share this with others, you can fill in the second form. So these are both two forms. And in the second form, you can share what uh, you contributed and then we will make sure that you can present this in one of our future community calls. So as we said originally, the community calls are usually on the last Wednesday of the month, but in December, this will be Christmas day. So maybe some people are not around and I will probably not be around. So we'll just make it one week earlier on the 18th of December. So for now, I want to say thank you for joining and we hope to see you again in the next call in December. Bye.